holy, infallible, eternal, indestructible word. We're going to find ourselves in Jonah chapter number one. I've entitled this series, A Well of a True Tale. A Well of a True Tale. The Bible says this now in Jonah chapter number one. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners, or the sailors, were afraid, and they cried every man unto his God, and cast forth wares, or the goods that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was down in the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Boy, could you imagine? So the shipmaster came to him, or the captain of the ship came to him and said unto him, What do you mean by this, O sleeper? Why are you sleeping? Arise, call upon thy God, and so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, Every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil, this storm, is upon us. So they cast lots. And the lot fell upon Jonah. God's got your number. Amen. Yes. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What comest thou? In other words, where do you come from? What is your country? What people are you from? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid and said unto him, Why have you done this? For the men knew, listen to this, For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. You see, if I had somebody tell me that they were fleeing from the Lord and that they were a pastor and they were getting on the same cruise ship I was getting on, I might just have to get my tickets away that day. Amen? <laughs> boy, oh boy. Look at verse 11. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, or to you, that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was rotten, was temptous. And he said unto them, Take me up, cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great temptus, or storm, basically a hurricane, is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not. For the sea was rocked and tempted us against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it has pleased you. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Man, could you imagine that? having somebody that said they were running from the Lord and that that storm was because of their rebellion and they threw him into the sea and all of a sudden the sea became calm immediately. That would get my attention as a pagan, amen? amen. Boy, it would. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered his sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish. Now we assume that it's a well. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's consider chapter 1. You can run, but you cannot hide. You can run, but you cannot hide. Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. I pray now with all my heart that, Lord, you would touch me, that you would do in me and through me what I cannot muster on my own. I pray with all my heart, Lord, that you would give me your anointing. Lord, help me to preach in your ability that you and you alone provide. Father, I just pray that your word would go forth in power, that, Lord, you'd open up every heart and mind, that, Lord, you would take away the deadness and the dullness that the flesh brings, that, Lord, you would quicken our spirits to hear your word, to receive your word today. Lord, I just pray that your people be revived and refreshed. 
Lord, I just pray that if there's anything in our lives that, Lord, is not pleasing to you, that you would convict us. Lord, as you tell us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, Lord, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, we just truly pray that you'll cleanse our hearts, you'll help refresh and revive our souls, or that your people truly be fed today. And Father, I pray if there's one that's lost that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that this would be the day that they would understand that you tell us very clearly and plainly in your word, for all have sinned against you. All have committed crimes and have rebelled against you, and the wages of sin is death and hell forever. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord, I just pray that you'll give them the faith to believe that you are truly God indeed, that you came to this earth, you lived a perfect life, you went to Calvary's cross, and on that cross you took every single one of their sins, past, present, and future, as you tell us in the book of Peter, Lord, that you bore all of our sins, the world's sins in your body, and that the wrath of God fell on you so that it would not fall on us, and that, Jesus, you paid in full every single sin that we have or ever would sin against you, on Calvary's cross, you said on your word that it is finished. The debt is paid in full. Lord, I just pray that you give them the faith to believe that you died, that you were buried. And Lord, I just pray that you give that one or several today that faith to believe that you, God, raised your son Jesus from the dead, that they would take their tongue and confess him as Lord. At the same time, be willing to turn from sin and self and truly give their heart and life to you, calling upon your name, asking for forgiveness. And Lord, you tell us in Romans chapter 10, all those that call upon your name shall be saved. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can run, but you can't hide. I remember when I was young, I did something wrong inside the house, and I knew I was going to get a spanking. And I remember my mom looking at me, telling me to come to her, and I said, man, no way, I'm out of here. And I remember I ran out of the house. I ran around the car, and for some reason the hose was out there. I think my dad was about to wash the car. The hose was actually turned on, and they had one of those little guns, you know what I'm talking about? Well, I remember running around the car, my mom was out there, and she was trying to get a hold of me. And you know how sometimes you get so irritated that you start to laugh because you're just so frustrated? Well, I was doing that to my mom. Well, then I started laughing. Well, that made it even worse. Uh-oh. Well, my mom was so mad that she tried to come around. Well, I just kind of lost my mind for a second, and I took that hose, and I started squirting her with it. I was like, well, maybe that'll cool her off. Amen? Well, I remember I got a spanking of my life, boy, for rebelling. You know, and boy, I tell you what, you know, you can run, but you can't hide. Amen? Now, as we dive into the book of Jonah, I'm going to preach through this whole book. So we want to, you know, go verse by verse, so I will go as long as time permits. So as we get into some of the background, understand that this book was written around 793 to 758 or 53 B.C. It was the time of Jeroboam, and uh, the second, if you will. And uh, he was a man who didn't do a lot of good, but Jonah was used of God. And we'll see that in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, because the Bible says this of the prophet Jonah, that he restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain. So in other words, if you look at the Galilee, he went all the way from the very northern point of the border of the promised land, which was far north as you could go in Israel, all the way down to the bottom of the Dead Sea. So God used him to restore the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath to the Sea of the Plain, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of Geth Hefer. So, it's one thing not to be sure of God's will and miss it, but it's another thing to know God's will and not do it and disobey it and be willful in doing it. Amen? And we're going to clearly see in this book many characteristics of God, but one of them being God's sovereignty. I love this book because it shows, and even though we're sinful, even though in the midst of our rebellion, God's will is not thwarted. God's will is going to be done no matter what. Amen? The Bible says, Many are the plans of a man's heart, but nevertheless the counsel of the Lord shall stand. So God shows us in this book that he's absolutely sovereign. In fact, God is so sovereign and so awesome 
that he used a racist to bring a national revival. And I also believe at the end of this book, he finally brought personal revival to Jonah himself. Jonah did not want the Ninevites to repent. And listen, when you get to a place in your heart, in your life, where your heart becomes so hard that you don't want people to repent, you don't want people to get right, but rather see them judge, see them judge by God and go to hell, my friend, that is what you call a pure racist, somebody that hates somebody. What does God's Word say? about a person that says they're saved, claims to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, but truly hates somebody. Well, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, whosoever hates his brother is a murderer. Yes. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So God is very clear about people that say they're saved, but they really, in actuality, hate somebody. God says they're deceived. They need to repent of sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Amen? Now, at the same time, I do believe a Christian can struggle with being prejudiced, though. Because prejudice is something that a person is taught. Something that they have to deal with. Because from a kid, some people have been taught to hate the color of other people's skins, their culture, where they're from, uh, what they drive. All kinds of things can be downloaded into a child and be taught that. So the Lord has to unteach people that. Amen? So I believe a person who's a Christian can struggle sometimes with being prejudiced. But you, if you truly hate somebody in your heart of hearts, man, you're lost and need to be saved. Amen? Boy, God's Word is very clear when it comes to that. Now, I believe that Jonah was a Christian because I believe Jonah was the one that God used to write the book of Jonah. And we can see that he is very plain about everything that he did. Amen? And I believe that at the end of this book that Jonah experienced a revival himself with God's love. You see, it's easy to want God's love. It's easy to receive God's love. It's easy to say, Lord, forgive me when I mess up and blow it. But boy, that spirit that he has right now to say, well, Lord, love me, forgive me, but barbecue everybody else, that is the spirit that God is going to deal with and visit. Amen? Because that is not the God of this Bible. Because it shows us that even though he's sovereign, even though that this book is a book where he is saying, listen, I'm going to bring judgment on this city, it also shows us that God is merciful to the merciless, to the merciless less. Amen? Yeah. God is a very gracious, loving, forgiving God. In fact, Jonah even brings that up in this book as he is talking to the Lord about his bitterness. Now, he's an 8th century prophet. The Bible says that he's from North Galilee, uh, from Gib Heifer. It's a few miles from Nazareth. It's west of the south southwest of the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jonah is from. Now Jonah is a real person. Amen? Because the Word of God says that he is. But there's a lot of people that try to discredit this book. But the Word of God says this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. Jesus speaking to the Pharisees said this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights and the fishes are whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Look at verse 41. Then men of Nineveh shall arise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Wow. You see, there's two different types of prophecy in the Word of God of the Old Testament. You have verbal prophecy, like the Bible says, and you shall call Jesus' name Emmanuel, God with us. The Bible says that he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and they named him Jesus. Amen? That's verbal prophecy, but there's also man, that visual prophecy, word pictures. The Lord is using this picture of Jonah to represent his resurrection from the dead. The Bible says that this wicked generation seeks a sign, but no sign shall be given except for the sign of Jonah... As he was three days and three nights, so the Son of Man also will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So it was a picture that he was using of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, <clears throat> when you look at Jesus, he uses this predicament to show the greatest sign of all, and that's the sign of his resurrection. 
The greatest miracle that can take place on this planet today is a person truly getting born again. Amen? The Bible says that you're dead in your trespasses and sin. The Bible says that when a person is willing to repent, turn from sin and self, Lord, I'm willing to stop sinning and I'm going to turn to you, and they receive Jesus Christ into their heart and life, the Holy Spirit takes that dead human spirit that died when Adam and Eve fell in the garden because we're born with a dead spirit. Being born again simply means this, being made alive again to God. And when a person repents and puts their trust in Jesus, he resurrects that human spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us, and we are made alive again to God. We're born again. Amen? And the Word of God says you must be born again, or you shall not see the kingdom of God. You have to be saved. Amen? And so Jesus uses him as a sign to the Ninevites. Wow. Now, Jesus warned the Jews. He warned the Pharisees of his day and said, This wicked Gentile Ninevites who had nothing but the message of judgment, yet in 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown. There was no promises of deliverance. There was no sign that God would say they would, if they repent, that God would have mercy on them. It was a message of judgment. Amen? Jesus said that that generation of Ninevites would rise up and judge the Israelites. Why? Because they have the miracles of Jesus. They have the Word of God Himself in the flesh, giving them the Word, the living Word. Amen? You see, when Jonah came, man, the Bible says that he was like a sign unto them, but man, they repented at the preaching of a stranger. But the Bible says in John chapter 1 that Jesus came unto His own, and His own received Him not and rejected Him, and God said, because one that is greater than Jonah is here, and not only am I greater than Jonah, but I'm also giving you the miracles of God, and yet they still refuse to repent. God said that the Ninevites would rise up in judgment against that generation. Now, Jesus, being all-knowing and all-powerful, would not quote the book of Jonah if Jonah was a fictitious character. The Lord will not discredit himself. Amen? Amen. Now, what does the name Jonah mean? Well, the name Jonah means dove. Isn't that interesting? The Holy Spirit came on Christ in the presence of a what? A dove. Like a dove lighted on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're saved, you have the power and presence of God Almighty in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? But sometimes we don't act like doves. We act like ravens. Amen? What do we do? I heard one man say that, you know, our symbol for this country is an eagle, but if we keep heading the same way that we are, we're going to look like a buzzard. We need Holy Spirit revival. We need the dove of the Holy Spirit once again to reunite the flames of Christians so that we can truly be the witnesses God's called us to be. Amen? Amen. Well, we do. Now... Sometimes, unfortunately, though, we can stray from God. The focus of this book is not Jonah himself. The focus of this book is not the well or the worm or the plant. The focus of this book is not the storm. The focus of this book is God Almighty himself. Amen? That is the focus of this book. In fact, it's the focus of every single book in the Bible. He is the main character. He's the number one. Amen? Amen. Now, in this book, we see him as a God of justice, but we also see him as a loving, forgiving, compassionate God. Jonah is a book or a snapshot of Israel. Jesus was using Jonah to rebuke the Pharisees. Jesus was using Jonah to say, hey, listen, because Jonah is the only Jewish prophet that was ever called, written in Scripture, to go to a different nation, a Gentile nation, to tell them to repent. Every other prophet you read about was sent to Israel and the nations that surrounded them, but Jonah was specifically sent 500 miles away to go tell the Ninevites, the Assyrians, that they had to repent. So it's a picture, as Jesus was using Jonah, to show, show the Pharisees, to show the nation of Israel their hardness, their coldness, their callousness, their stubbornness, their self-centeredness, and the fact that God wanted Israel to be the light of the entire world, but they dropped the ball and said, God only loves us. He doesn't love anybody else. Well, 
they miss what the Bible said in Exodus chapter 12, when, or, or in Genesis chapter 12, when God was talking to Abraham and giving him the covenant of the promised land. Remember that? And your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be what? Blessed. Amen. Christ is going to come and be a blessing to all nations. Why? Because all nations, all creeds, all cultures can truly have a relationship with God Almighty through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me, Jesus said. Amen? So, he was showing them that Israel also referred to as a dove, interesting enough, but they failed to be the lighthouse that God wanted them to be. So this book is undisputedly also shows us God's heart for missions. Amen? It's His passion. It's His heartbeat. Jesus Christ was the greatest missionary there ever was or ever will be. And Jesus Christ's passion is the same exactly today for your soul as it was for the very souls of the people that murdered Him on Calvary's cross. And He looked down as He was bleeding his red royal blood and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That same passion is the same passion that Jesus Christ has for souls today. Amen? Amen. He does. How do I know? Because the Bible says that he is the same today, yesterday, and forever. So don't ever think that Jesus Christ is not passionate for the lost, because he is. And he wants to use your life to be used in a way that he can use your vessel, this body, to bring you alongside people as his rescue boat to tell people the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, and how they can turn from sin and self, receive the eternal forgiveness that God wants to give and will give if they do that, putting all their trust in Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross, and the fact that he was raised from the dead. Amen? Amen. But there's a lot of Christians that think they're a cruise ship. No, you're a rescue boat, amen? Because if Jesus Christ truly lives in you, then I know for a fact that Jesus Christ has a burden for all the lost people that you meet on a daily basis, amen? And they're going to either live in heaven forever or they're going to live in hell forever. So I know for a fact that Jesus is concerned for their souls and He wants to use your life to do it. Amen? That's why Jesus says after you shall receive the Holy Spirit, you shall be. Not might be, could be. One day, I'll get around to it. No, you shall be my witnesses, present tense, right now, 24-7, 365, as you're breathing air. If you're a Christian, you are God's witness. Amen? It's a command, not the great suggestion to go out and tell people about the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. He has a heart for missions. He's showing us Israel's hardness to those who are outside. He demonstrates that in the character of Jonah. So in this book, this book is basically the equivalent of the John 3.16 in the New Testament. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him, puts their trust in Him, turns from sin, should not perish, go to hell, but have everlasting life. This book is truly the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament because it shows us that God has mercy on people who showed no mercy for their enemies whatsoever. God truly loves people. Amen? His love blows my mind. The Bible says in Ephesians that His love goes beyond our understanding and it truly does. How many of you get irritated when you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off? I'll tell you what irritates me is when someone wants to drive 10 miles under the speed limit, amen? <laughs> and then they have their friend next to them in the other lane that says, you know, I, I, that's a great idea. So then now you can't get around, amen? <laughs> I know you're like me. I know what you say. You say, God bless you, man, amen? <laughs> I know your time's just as important as mine, amen? Is that what you say? Uh-uh. <laughs> Now think about how irritated you really truly can get at somebody that you've never met. You don't even know their name. They've never said one word to you, but this is how irritated you can get. But think about true sin. True rebellion against the very heart of God himself towards you. And then think about his patience and his mercy 
and His grace and His love and His kindness. Amen? And what an awesome, amazing God. No wonder that man said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow, we'll never truly know the depth and the appreciation that we truly need to have for God's love and patience for our life. But I praise God that He is that God. Amen? Yes. You see now, in Jonah chapter 1, as we move through this, we're going to see Jonah running from God. In Jonah chapter 2, we're going to see Jonah running to God. In Jonah chapter 3, we're going to see Jonah running with God. And then in Jonah chapter 4, we're going to see Jonah having a head-on collision with the Lord. It's going to be Jehovah versus Jonah. And I can tell you right now who's going to win. Amen? Yes. It's going to be the Lord. So first of all, as we look at this passage of Scripture with the time we have remaining, you can run, but you can't hide. Psalm 139, verse number 7, 9, and 10 must have escaped Jonah's memory because the Bible says this, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or where shall I free from thy presence? If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me. Amen? Amen. Boy, I don't care where you go. I don't care where you try to hide. Man, the Bible says that daylight and dark are both alike unto the Lord. Amen? Where can the men of iniquity hide themselves in dens? You can't hide from the Lord. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil that goes on. Jonah, you and I cannot escape the sight of God. He sees all. He knows all. He knows it all before you've even done one thing. Jesus Christ knew every single sin that you would commit from the time you were born to the time that you died, even before the world began, because He is all-knowing, perfect God. Amen? Amen? You can't hide. Now, you can try to hide. You can try to run, but you can't. Have you ever played hide-and-seek with a two-year-old? Man, a two-year-old will try to hide behind one of these like this. This is how God sees you trying to hide, amen? <laughs> you trying to hide behind that, boy. He can see you from a mile away, amen? <laughs> but nevertheless, we try it, though, don't we, sometimes? So I want you to see, first of all, under this heading, you can run but you can't hide, Roman numeral number one, if you're taking notes, let's look at Jonah's descent. Jonah's descent. Look at chapter one, verse one. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. Boy, what would it be like if it didn't come? You know, the Bible says that He has spoken to us in these last days by His Son in the book of Hebrew. If you're saved, you can put your name right where Jonah was. Now the word of the Lord came unto you and say your name. Praise God that the word of God comes to us. Amen? Just like He came to Jonah, the word of God also comes to you and I. Now notice what it says. Arise and go to Nineveh. Now, in the Hebrew language, this is an imperative, which means it's a command. God is not suggesting for Jonah to go. God didn't ask for Jonah to take some time and think about going. No, God commands Jonah to go to Nineveh because that's God's will for Jonah to preach to these people who are wicked that need to repent. Amen? Yes. Now, there's three verbs in the Hebrew. Notice what they are. Arise. Well, I like that because God also calls you to arise. And then he says go. You see, Christianity is not just sitting and soaking in a service. Christianity is getting off our blessed derrieres and doing God's will. Amen? Doing what God tells us to do. Go. Now, that's easy to preach, but boy, it's very difficult sometimes to really go do that. Amen? Boy, it can be. But notice what he also says to Nineveh. He gave Jonah a specific assignment. He called him. He called him to action. He gave him a specific assignment. You see, we see God's revealed specific will for Jonah. It's a wonderful thing to know that God also has a plan and a very specific will for you as well. Amen? He does. I heard one man say this, the greatest assignment in your life is to find out what God's will is and do it. And do it with all of your heart. Amen? Look at chapter 1, verse number 2 now. It says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up against me. 
Now, three times the city of Nineveh is mentioned in the book of Jonah. And in this particular reference, it's referring to the greatness of the Ninevites' wickedness. This city was known for a city of wickedness. In fact, the Bible says that their wickedness was so great that it came up to the Lord himself. God said the same thing about Sodom and Gomorrah. Boy, their sin plate was entirely full. God was about to act. God's calling his man Jonah to stand in the gap and to tell these people that they need to repent now. <clears throat> the city and the mention of the name of the city caused Jonah to rebel and run. Why? Now the Bible doesn't say, but when you look at the Ninevites, you look at who they were and you look at what they practiced, well, I can see why Jonah probably wanted to run. I can probably understand why Jonah wanted to see these people judge. But you see, what Jonah forgot was this, though. God is a God that loves everybody the same. Amen? <coughs> so if it's good enough for you and I to receive the grace of God and the love of God and the forgiveness of God, then it all is enough for everybody else to receive that same love and forgiveness. Even though forgiveness can be a very difficult thing, especially when people truly hurt you. People say hurtful things to you, have done hurtful things to you, and they don't repent of it. You try to talk to them about it, and they look at you like you just fell off the planet and you took a, a vacation from your brain. That, that, that stuff hurts. It can be very deep-rooted and deep-seated. But we can never forget, though, that God has forgiven us of every single thing that we have done or ever will do. And God in us will give us the ability to release those people and to forgive. That doesn't mean that you're saying what they did was right. That doesn't mean that you've got to trust them. But what that means is, is that you've got to release them, forgive them, and let God deal with them. And pray for their heart. Pray for their repentance. Pray if they're lost that they'll be saved. Amen? Jonah temporarily forgot that when you look at this story. Hmm. Now, this prophet had no compassion. He had no concern whatsoever. But yet, there was a God in heaven that did. Now, Nineveh was founded by Nimrod. His name, when you look at it, means to rebel. Isn't that interesting? Because it was Nimrod that built the Tower of Babel. He built many cities. And the chief city was the city of Nineveh. At this time, the population was about 600,000 men. So if you look at all the women and children that were there, the total population might have been a million. We're not exactly sure, but there was a lot of people that were breathing air that were going to go to hell if they didn't get the message of God's Word. Amen? There's a lot of people in Sun City Center that if they don't get the message of God's Word are going to go to hell. They need to hear the Gospel. Amen? Or they did. Now, this city was... The Assyrian Empire, it was located on the Tigris River, which today would be modern Turkey. It was known for wickedness. Or I'm not, not, not Turkey, but modern Iraq. Well, let me get my head on right together. Amen? Modern Iraq. It was known for its wickedness. They were Israel's enemy. And boy, they were hated. They were known for their cruelty, for their heartlessness, their idolatrous ways, their deceit. They would decapitate people. They would literally take people and skin them alive and then impale them and throw them out in the desert where the sun could beat down on them, where animals and critters could crawl on them. They would also bury their enemies in the sand to their necks. They would skin their head, let the sun beat down on them, and anything that decided it wanted a meal would eat those people alive. Now, guys, I'm not trying to be graphic just to be graphic, but these people were cruel. In fact, scholars tell us in history that the Israels, when they heard that the Assyrians were coming, a lot of them just went ahead and committed suicide because they didn't want to live or have to face the torture that these cruel Assyrians would do. They would also take people's children and burn them alive in front of their parents. So guys, this city was filled with demonic activity. Amen? Satan was having a field day with these people. Now remember, the Bible says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spirits of wickedness in high places. So the enemy was having a field day. So when the word of the Lord came to Jonah, 
Jonah said in modern translation, Dave's translation say what? You want me to do what? You want me to go where? He probably did a Moses and said, man, you have clearly got the wrong man, boy. And Jonah, the Bible says, tells, knew what God wanted them to preach. Now you think that when God told him what he wanted to preach before he got there, that Jonah would be elated. Notice what it says in chapter 3, verse 4, Yet in forty days Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now the content of that, music, of that message you would think would be music to his ears, but that's exactly what Jonah was hoping for. But the Bible says that Jesus wept over his city. Jonah wanted to see the destruction of a city. In fact, what city did Jesus weep over? Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I often wanted to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks. But what city was Jerusalem? Was it, was it not the very city that the Pharisees who hated him, who had murder in their hearts, that wanted to see him dead? Was it that city that Jesus wept over? That our God is a compassionate, loving, kind, forgiving, awesome God, full of mercy, full of grace, amen? amen. And yet Jonah wanted to see the destruction of the Ninevites. Man, the Bible says in chapter 4, verse 1, listen to this, it displeased Jonah and he was exceedingly angry. Wow. You say, well, what was his problem? Why did Jonah run? Well, he knew what kind of God God really was. Because in chapter 4, verse number 2, the Bible says, <clears throat> listen to this, for I knew you are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger, and of great kindness. Isn't that interesting that Jonah is upset that God is a God of kindness, that God is a God of mercy, that God is a God of grace. He's upset with the Lord for being that kind of God. Why? Because Jonah had ingrown eyeballs and all he could see was himself and what he wanted. Amen? Go to Nineveh so those wicked people can be forgiven. You better go find somebody else, Lord. That was what was in his heart in verse 3 of chapter 1. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, Jonah had a will, and he could use it to either obey God or disobey God. We all have that choice, amen? God doesn't put a chain on us and force us to do his will. So Jonah decided, I am going to disobey the Lord. God said, Jonah, go to Nineveh, and Jonah said, there's no way. Now let me ask you this question, and I'll close with this, and we'll pick up next Sunday. What is your Nineveh? What's that thorn in your side that God might want you to truly deal with? You see, Nineveh comes in all different sizes and shapes, amen? Nineveh comes in the form of, you need to forgive that sister, that brother. You need to forgive that man, that dad, that mom, that uncle, that cousin, that friend. You need to forgive. Now, you're not going to forgive, but you need to release them. That's why the Bible says, leave, leave room for the wrath of God. I will repay, says the Lord. But that's not our heart, though, amen? Because you've got to go back and say, God, you had mercy on me. God, you love me. God, you forgive me. Listen, when you truly sin against God, even today, do you not want God's mercy? Do you not want God's love? Do you not want that second chance to get it right before He comes and disciplines your life? Raise your hand if that's what you really truly feel. Lord, I want your love. I want your forgiveness. I don't want to be taken to the woodshed. Nobody does. Amen? Well, if you want that for yourself, don't you think that also the person that you're upset with also needs the same thing from the Lord? Amen? Yes, it's difficult. But with God's help, you can do it. Amen? You can. And, and, and I'm not saying that lightly. I know it, it can be very difficult because there are things that people go through that are unspeakable and despicable. But with God's help, you can release that person. Because listen, the re reality is this. There's not one person on this planet, I don't care who they are, that are getting away with anything. They are not getting away with anything. They are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God will judge them for every word, every action, every intent, every wrong attitude, every single thing they've ever done, thought, or had in their heart. God is going to expose it all and they will give an account to Him just like you and I will give an account to Him 
as well. Amen? And your Nineveh might be God telling you to use your time in a different way. But Lord, I'm retired. But Lord, you know, I've, I've worked hard. I, I've done all these things. But, but the Lord is calling you to use your time. Maybe put more time into this church. Maybe to put more time into this community to serve it. Maybe God is calling you to do that. And that's a wrestling match right now with you. I don't know what your Nineveh is, but Nineveh comes in all different sizes and shapes. Amen? Nineveh also could be saying three words. I am sorry to your wife, to your husband. You see, God wants to knock down the city of Nineveh. God wants to knock down that city of pride because sometimes people get so prideful they don't like saying they're sorry. They can't admit that they're wrong and by doing so they think they're protecting themselves but the reality is this, they are descending. As the Bible says that Jonah went down to Joppa, he went down into the sides of the ship. He went down to the bottom of the sea. Down, 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 down. Jonah went down when he didn't do what God's Word said for him to do. My friend, when you get to a place in your life where you can't admit you're wrong to your family or your friends and apologize to them, you're hurting yourself and you're hurting your family and you're hurting your walk in fellowship with the Lord. Amen? God, listen, with all my heart, with all the tenderness I can muster, I know it's hard to forgive people who hurt you. A lifetime of it is very difficult to do. But you've got to realize that God has forgiven you also for eternity for all that you've done against Him as well. Amen? I'm sorry that I hurt you. I, I admit that I'm wrong. We, have, we can struggle with that. Amen? So what's your Nineveh? Is it a place that God wants you to go that you don't want to deal with? I remember one time there was a group of people that couldn't stand me. They didn't like me in any shape, form, or fashion. They didn't like my preaching. They didn't like the way I wore my tie. I mean, they just didn't like me at all. And I remember I had to go to a funeral with all those people that didn't like me. And I can say before the Lord that I loved them, I helped them, I visited them when they were sick, I prayed with them when they were down. But they just didn't like straight preaching. They just didn't. And they didn't like the messenger. And they wanted to kill the messenger. But I remember I had to go back to a funeral with all those same people. And God was teaching me a valuable lesson. Dave, sometimes my love, the Bible says the, the love of Christ compels us. My love is going to put you in situations that you don't want to be in whatsoever. But I, the Lord, love these people, died for these people, care for these people just as much as I care for you. Pray for them. Amen? What's your Nineveh? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time that you've given to us. Lord, I just pray now with all my heart that if there's anyone that's lost, that does not know you as Lord and Savior, they can't truly think of a time where they truly admitted to you that they were guilty, for you tell us in your word, for all have sinned and falling short of your standard. I'm asking you right now, has there been a time in your life where you truly came to the Lord Jesus and admitted to Him and knew in your heart of hearts that you were guilty, that you were a sinner, that you couldn't save yourself? The Bible says you're saved by grace, God's grace, through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works. At least anyone should boast or brag that you had something to do with getting to heaven because you don't. The Bible says that we're saved by His grace and His mercy alone. Has there been a time in your life where you truly said, God, I'm guilty, I'm willing to turn from my sin and self, and I'm surrendering all of me to all of you, and I'm asking you to forgive me. I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you died and were buried. I believe that God raised you from the dead, Lord. I'm asking you to forgive me, and I'm willing right now to turn from sin and self, and I'm calling upon you to forgive me. Has there been a time in your life where you have truly have done that in a real way. The Bible says, If anyone be in Christ, behold, he or she is a brand new creation. Old things pass away, and all things become new in your life. God will discipline your life. God will change your life. Love will be coming out of your life. Man, conviction of sin and the things that you do wrong will be coming out of your life. You'll not like it when you sin. You'll be bothered by sin. God will change everything about your heart and your life when you get saved. If you were to die right now, listen, would you put your confidence and your testimony that you will truly go to heaven when you die? 
Eternity is too long for you to be wrong. I'm not trying to scare you, but I just want you to make sure that you know that you know that you're saved. Jesus said, I've written these things unto you that you may know you have eternal life. He wants you to know. It's not a hope so, a think so, a 99.9% so. It's a no-so salvation. So if the Lord has led you and showed you that you're lost and you need to be saved, I want you to pray this prayer as the piano begins to play. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm lost. And I'm a sinner. And I know that I cannot save myself. Lord, right now I'm asking you to forgive me. And I'm willing to turn from my sin and self. And Lord, I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. I'm confessing you as my Lord and Savior. And I'm asking you to forgive me and save me. And change my life forever. Would there be anybody that say, Brother Dave, that was me today? I prayed to receive Christ in a real way. Just simply raise your hand, no one looking around. Anybody at all say, Brother Dave, that was me. All right, church, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Where are you at right now with the Lord? Are you running? And maybe you don't know it. And God revealed to you today that maybe you are. Are you having difficulty with your Nineveh? That person, that thing, that place. That decision. I want you to just thank God. If God has spoken to your heart today in any way, I just want to say, Lord, thank you for speaking to my heart today. Number two, I want you to say, Lord, now I am willing and I need you to do in me and through me what I can't do for myself. And Lord, I need you to help me do what it is that you're asking me to do. Here's my heart. Strengthen me, Lord. Help me to be able to do that. And then number three, I just want you to take a moment. Just thank God for his love. Thank God for his forgiveness. Thank God for the fact that if you know you're saved, that you're never going to go to hell. That you're going to have an unspeakable place to be able to dwell, and that's in heaven with the most precious, awesome, wonderful person that you could ever know. And that's Jesus Christ and God the Father and the Holy Spirit Himself. So take a moment and do that. Maybe there's someone in here saying, Brother Dave, I, I believe that God's called me to join this church and I want to serve and use the gift that God's given me. So if you'd stand to your feet right now, we're going to have one hymn of invitation, just one. Come forward. Come move. If God's spoken to you, if you need prayer, I'll be down here at these aisles. If you'll stand to your feet if you're able to. If you're not, don't worry. No one's going to think anything different of you. But, but come. If God has spoken to your heart, you want prayer, you feel like this might be the place that God's calling you to serve, come. Come right now.